So thank you for joining us here at Love and Money Secrets TV. I am your host, Dame Lillian Walker, and today we are reading Chapter 13, Project Coherence, Making it a Better World for the book, Becoming Supernatural. So let's get started. We are living in a time of extremes, and these extremes are both a reflection of an old consciousness that can no longer survive a future consciousness in which planet Earth herself and all of us on Earth are transforming. This old consciousness is driven by our survival emotions like hatred, violence, prejudice, anger, fear, suffering, competition, and pain. Emotions that serve to seduce us into believing we are separate from one another. I'm gonna pause right here because I think it's interesting if you think about this and just take a moment to reflect on these last couple sentences. This old consciousness is driven by survival emotions like hatred, violence, prejudice, anger, fear, suffering, competition, and pain. These are emotions that serve to seduce us into believing we are separate from one another. Because obviously, whenever we have any of these emotions, we guard ourselves. It's not a time to be loving and open-hearted. It's a time to protect this one individual body. If you are a mother and you have children, you better bet your bottom dollar that that mama bear instinct is going to flare up and not only protect your individual self, but you're gonna do anything and everything possible to protect your child or your children because no one's going to harm them. If, if, if you have anything to do with it, nothing is gonna stand uh, in your way and you are going to stop anything that is trying to harm your child. There are things that you normally wouldn't even do for yourself, but once you have a child, it's like, whoa, this thing comes up in you where it's like, whoa, before I would have just like let that go and know now because it's my child, no, you, you don't, no, that's not okay for you to treat my child that way. And it's, no, you cannot take advantage. You're a grown up. How dare you treat, you know, a child or my child that way. And in fact, I'm going to give you an example. Years ago here in Huntington Beach, we had this fabulous bookstore. It was called Zany Brainy. It was awesome. Zany Brainy was an interactive children's bookstore. I wish they still had it, but they don't. But when my kids were small, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, they had Zany Brainy. And when they first opened up, they had a book reading club. And uh, I think my son was about five years old at the time. So I signed him up and I had one or two other friends that they signed up their children as well. And so, you know, long story short we got our book bags which had the books that we were going to be reading i can't remember if it, if it was four weeks six weeks eight weeks i do remember that it was i think all summer long so it must have been like eight or 16 weeks so every week we would meet i think it was like every thursday at four o'clock you go and you bring your kid, you bring your book that, you know, that you're reading and they would read it out loud. And then of course the child would have their own book that they would follow uh, the reading, right? And it was to help encourage the kids to not only read, but to get better at reading and to make it fun because you're in this big group. And then afterwards, of course, then there's tons of books and awesome educational games in the store. So of course you look around and all that. So I was there with a friend and I'll never forget her adorable son, Martine. You know, he had his book bag with his books just because he was my, my son's best friend. And all of a sudden we were, it was like five minutes before it was getting ready to start. And then my friend tells me, oh my gosh, somebody took Martine's book. He, he's telling me that, you know, that his book was here just a second ago and his book is gone. And I said, what, how, how is that possible? And I said, are you sure the book was in the book bag when you got here? And she says, oh, absolutely, most definitely. And I said, that's strange. And then, and then she motioned to me, she goes, I think that lady over there took his book. I said, well, do you have the book marked on the inside 
you know, because like on the inside of my kid's book, I put, you know, his name, Kyle Walker, blah, blah, blah. And so she goes, oh yeah, his name is on the inside of the book. And I said, well, why don't you just walk over there and say, oh, excuse me, do you mind if I check something in your book? And, and then you can open the book and if you see that his name is in there, then you'll know for a fact that she obviously took the book. And then you're like, oh, you know, I can take this back. This is mine. She, she wasn't, she was a little too coy. And that was the first time I realized that I had this mama bear thing in me because I love Martine to this day as if he were my own son. He's like my nephew. And so when I saw that an adult was taking advantage of a child, that she, you know, for whatever reason, she's not willing to spend the money for herself and for her kid. And she's willing to steal from an innocent five-year-old I thought, you have to do something. And then when my friend wasn't willing to do something, I'm like, I can't stand for this. This is unacceptable. So I said, if you won't do it, I'm gonna do it. So I, I got up and I looked over to the lady. I said, um, do you mind if I take a look at the inside cover of your book? And she said, oh, sure. So I opened the book. Sure enough, there was his name, Martine. And I said, oh, you know what? You have my nephew's book. I need to take this back. And then she just kind of looked at me, kind of dumbfounded. I just took the book back. I very, very matter of fact, you know, gave it back to Martine. And then Martine, if you saw him, he was like this little cherub with these little golden locks and everything, so adorable. And then he was happy again, because he was sad, because all of a sudden his book was gone. He didn't think that it was stolen. He just knew that it was gone. So going back to these emotions of anger, fear, suffering, competition, and pain, when we're in those lower third, the first, the second, and the third energy centers, just to recap, the first energy center is at the base of your perineum. That's where your sexual organs are. It's the base of your spine. So it's the very bottom right there. Then your second energy center is two inches below your belly button. And then your third energy center is two inches above your belly button, also known as the solar plexus. And then of course your fourth is your heart. When our energy gets locked in because we're in any of these survival emotions, then we become separate. So what does that mean? When we become separate, that means that we're no longer pure love. We're, no, we're literally collapsing our electromagnetic field out of preservation because we are in a fight or flight mode and we're pulling all of our survival energy you know to that first three lower lower third lower chakras lower energy centers so that if you have to you have the energy to bolt you're able to take off like a rocket ship you're able to run that's why it's the fight or flight you either bolt you know you're gonna run dash however you want to call it or you're going to put up your dukes and you're going to fight and so all the energy goes there the blood literally rushes there to your gut and that viscera mesentery all that pleurisy all that area that's in your stomach region it's all going to go there because again you have to have the energy for the it's like the center of your will is right there in your third energy center once you start to understand some of the dynamics and the purposes of your different energy centers and it starts to make sense then you can start to not just understand but you it makes sense for you to manage the energy in your energy centers and then to unlock that energy so it's not locked in your first your second or third energy center when you don't have to fight or flight when you don't have to preserve yourself because there is no eminent threat right now of anyone biting off your arms or your legs, of somebody coming and attacking you where you have to fight. No, it's like you're safe, you're cool, you're calm. Even, I'm going to even say, even right now during the current, this video is being recorded on May 5th, 2020. So in light of the global crisis, pandemic, uh, situation, challenge, whatever nomenclature you have addressed to this current state of being, because it is a current, current state of being, you can choose, you can completely live in a life of peace, of love and serenity, despite that. Because 
that external threat, it's an external, not an internal, it's an external threat. However, if you're in the first, the second, and the third energy center is, you're not just keeping it to an external threat. Chances are you have it as an internal threat, which is why you are gripping fear. You have worry and you have anxiety and nervousness that that exterior threat is going to attack you. But the reality really truly is, if you look at the numbers, we have 7 billion people on the planet. Out of 7 billion people, the majority of the 7 billion people are healthy. The majority of the population is healthy, not unhealthy. Regardless of what illness you want to focus on, whether the fear or the threat of a virus or viruses or bacteria, bacterias, germs, syndromes, whatever. So the likelihood is that you are going to be well and you're going to be fine. If you are fine right now, you're probably going to continue to be fine because if you are healthy right now, even if you're healthy and you are recovering from some sort of trauma as a result of a car accident, a trauma as a result of, you know, an injury that happened on the job, um, anything physical like that where you have physical pain that you're still dealing with and your body is healing from that, that doesn't still, that doesn't necessarily predispose you to catching any, any of these other things. So you can decide, it's like, okay, yeah, no, I'm not going to act in worry anger, fear, anxiousness, stress. Yeah, any, maybe you, maybe you can't even, maybe you're not even able to articulate the emotion, but you know that it doesn't feel good. And I will say for myself, I have had times where I cannot, I know that something doesn't feel right, but I couldn't give it a name. And if you look back at, there's a video I think that I did on challenge that I did when I was in the monastery in Cancun. And I talk about how I was 50 feet up in the air and I had just, you know, the, the ladder was not even at an inclination. You know, normally you will have something that is, is a little bit inclined, you know, like a ladder will be a little bit inclined. This ladder was straight up. If I find the video, in fact, I have the video, Happy Faces Cancun 2019. You, if you want, you can watch the whole thing. You'll see how the ladders are like straight up. So you, you almost feel like you're falling backwards. You don't have the benefit of, you know, leaning a little forward. So anyhow, you get at the very top of that little two by two. And then once I was up there and once I was standing on it, all of a sudden, you know, in my mind, I didn't feel nervous. I didn't feel by the time I was up there, I had talked my way and I thought that I was fine, at least my mind, which is separate from my body, but my mind, my brain does command my body. So, and if you don't know that, you have to learn that and embrace that and recognize that. And once you realize that, that awareness is what gives you the power to command it, to order your body so that you don't act with nervousness, anxiety, fear, whatever the descriptor is. So anyhow, so as I was on the, that top plank, I realized all of a sudden, I was like, oh my gosh, my body, I literally thought my body is betraying me. Why are my legs shaking? All of a sudden my legs were shaking uncontrollably and my brain was thinking, I'm not afraid. However, my legs were acting like I was afraid because why else would my legs be shaking? So I'm like, I'm obviously nervous. And I'm like, wait a minute, I can't afford to be leaking energy with shaking legs. So even though I couldn't, my mind couldn't wrap itself around the concept that my body was feeling fear or whether it was fear or nervousness or both, the bottom line was my body was reacting with shaking and shaking is not being at peace and shaking takes energy so it was wasting my energy and i knew that i couldn't waste any energy because here i'm standing on a two by two platform and now i have to manage walking on a plank that's 50 feet in the air and it's that it's the width of my shoes i'm like i can't be shaking i have to be steady eddie 
So that's what I mean about sometimes, sometimes we aren't able to language or label what the emotion is. And so what I want to tell you is that it doesn't matter, that it's okay. As long as you know the difference between what feels good and what doesn't feel good, what feels lighter and what feels darker, there's a clue and a secret there. So I'll never forget years ago, probably at least seven or eight years ago, um, I remember somebody telling me very distinctly, I was in, in a quandary, in, in a bit of a dilemma over two, two choices that I had to make. I had, I had option A and option B, which way I was going to go, either yes or no, should I take this, should I not, blah, blah, blah. And the person who languaged it to me, instead of saying, well, rather than picking either or, how about this? How about if you think about this, which option feels lighter? Which one feels heavier? Or which one feels lighter to you, as in the color light? And which one feels darker to you? Instantly, I said, oh, well, this feels lighter. This feels really, really heavy. And in that moment, I had my answer. I said, wow, when I thought about it the other way, the way I always thought about it, I couldn't, I was kind of like in between. I'm like, oh, which one should it be? When I thought about this option and I thought of it as it being lighter in weight versus heavier, lighter in color, brighter, as opposed to darker, all of a sudden I had crystal clear clarity. I got to tell you, that one little tip has been a game changer for me. And if you take nothing away from this chapter, I hope that you at least take that one concept and start to implement it in your life. And if you do, and you start to see results, I would love, absolutely adore, to hear feedback from you on how it made a difference and what you felt. Because make no mistakes, as logical as we try to be as human beings, even the most critical analytical thinking people, when it comes to certain life situations, especially when they're under stress, they don't necessarily make decisions based on logic and intellect. Oftentimes what happens, nine out of 10 times, because we are emotional creatures, we don't make things based, we don't make our decisions based on logic, we may make them based on emotions. And so, and then things happen. And I saw that time and time again, when I had my real estate company and when I had my mortgage company too, I remember thinking, it's like, gee whiz, it just always would take me aback how some people would flip of a switch just overnight. They would just decide, ah, I just decided that we're going to sell our house and we're going to buy another one. We don't necessarily need to, we just feel like having a change economics. It didn't matter how much more it was going to cost them. It was more of like, they just feel, felt that they wanted to make a change and they were going to do it. They wanted to decorate a new home. And I thought to me, I would never do that because to me, it's like when I commit to things, I commit to things long-term and I, I don't like to be moving all the time. And although, yeah, I, everybody, I, I enjoy, you know, decorating and creating a new home environment and so forth, but to be flipping the switch every year or every two or three years just was not my thing. And so I, I saw through the thousands of people that I dealt with over two decades, both in my mortgage bank, as well as my international real estate uh, brokerage. It was amazing to me the way, the way people make their decisions when it comes to dealing with their finances and their homes, which is normally for most people, their homes is their biggest investment. When it came to business people, it was entirely different because I had a very large pool of investors and there it was more of a critical thinking uh, thing. And then of course they had a certain amount of intuition that they exercised to pull the trigger on things. So the illusion of separation taxes and divides individuals, communities, societies, countries, and mother nature herself. So the mindless, careless greed and disrespect of human activity is threatening life as we know it. By pure logic and reason, this type of consciousness cannot sustain itself for much longer. 
because everything is moving toward extreme polarities. Undeniably, many of the current systems, whether political or economic, religious, cultural, educational, medical, or environmental are being pulled apart as antiquated paradigms collapse. So these paradigms are currently in collapse and it's happening at warp speed as, as I speak these very words in this very moment. So we can see this most predominantly and prominently in journalism where no one knows what to believe anymore. Some of these changes reflect people's choices, while others reflect increasing levels of personal awareness. One thing is apparent, however, in this age of information, everything that is not in alignment with the evolution of this new consciousness is coming to the surface. If you aren't aware that there is an increase in frequency and energy occurring at this time, an increase in anxiety, tension, and passion, then you might not be paying attention to your own state of being and mankind's interconnectedness to this energy. In addition to the upheavals in our highly charged political, social, economic, and personal environments, many people also feel as if time is speeding up or that more momentous happenings are occurring in a shorter amount of time. Depending on your outlook, this could be either an exciting time of awakening or an anxiety inducing moment in history. So regardless, the old must fall away and break down so that something more functional can emerge in its place. This is how people, species, consciousness, and even the planet itself evolves. This excitement and energy, both within humans and nature, begs several questions. Could greater influences be at play that are affecting mankind's correlation to violence, war, crime, and terrorism? And conversely, peace, unity, coherence, and love? And is there a reason why all this is happening at this particular time? I gotta interject here because lately I've been overall throughout this, I'm a generally speaking pretty happy happy, um, vivacious uh, kind of individual. And I've been accused more than once to seeing the world with rose colored glasses. And if I see a glass, I always see that it's half full. I don't see that it's half empty. And so I always see it, the bright side of things. And I always see the silver lining, lining. There really is, in my opinion, a silver lining on every cloud. And so I have had though, because I'm human, I've had a few times where for a, a short time period in a day where I'm like, why is it that I am living in a time where we would have this global bizarre pandemic? And not, not to say that I was in a pity party or anything, but it really makes you want to wonder of all the times that I could have come to planet Earth and embody myself in this particular container, why would I be here during this outrageous uh, phenomena, which by all means, I must say, I've had it pretty posh and pretty easy. It hasn't been that bad for me in comparison to many of my friends who are in Palermo, Jardini Naxos, you know, different parts of the world, uh, Isla Canaria and in Spain, Toledo, etc. And so, and I've got lots of friends in the UK and the Netherlands and, and uh, lots of, actually quite a few in the UK and in Australia. And so, and in, in Italy, it's been horrible. They just yesterday, knock on wood, just yesterday, they finally gave them the orders that even though the quarantine isn't completely done, but at least they're out, let go outside of their homes. So instead of the streets in Palermo being bare now, now people are out there walking. You can walk, you can jog, you can run, you can actually get outdoors. Um, and so things are loosening up. Um, in fact, I might even play for you one of my friends who is in Palermo, Justina. I'm going to share with you, just so that you hear it straight from the horse's mouth, as they say. Hi guys, 
sorry for our late response. <laughs> yeah, well, when we were at home, like, um, staying, so yes, we did with our friends, uh, something like this, online, uh, more cocktails party, not dinner, so it was, it was interesting. But now, finally, oh, video. From yesterday, we can go out to go for a walk, like jogging, also to make a reservation, uh, we can go also to the parks, so it's getting better. Also, the weather is great, uh, these days it's plus 25, uh, someone really said nice. that tomorrow should be plus 30, so <laughs> really it's hot, getting actually. better. Oh, what is really... So you don't have to hear the second part, you get the gist of it. So basically, things are getting better, which day by day in every way, things are getting better and better, they really are. It does make you wonder, there's no, it's not an accident that I and you are actually living at this time in this space in history before you were embodied in the container that was issued to you at birth. You made an agreement with the great I am. You knew everything that was going to happen. You knew the challenges. You knew the lessons that you were supposed to come to learn and you agreed to it. So apparently I agreed to it, you agreed to it. Now, what I did as I pondered the questions like why of all the times in history, you know, why am I here during this pandemic? I had, I did do, do a little bit of soul searching and I'm like, what is it that I'm supposed to learn from this? What is it that I'm supposed to share? More and more of that is being revealed. It's not like everything is, you know, revealed to me in a moment nor do I think that all of it, perhaps it'll, you know, everybody's different. So perhaps to you, it'll all be revealed and crystallized in that moment. But what I'm just saying is that if you have those thoughts, rather than letting it fester inside your mind, take up the conversation with the, with the divine. You don't have to mull it over by yourself. Bring it to whatever, you know, uh, whatever source you have, and I mean, God doesn't care what you call him. The universe, the source, the infinite source intelligence, the great I am, whatever, you know, Gaia, Mother Earth, however you choose to language it, it doesn't care. It doesn't even really identify us, you know, with our names. It knows our soul signature, our soul thumbprint, if you will. And so it speaks to us at a much greater level and we understand, and it's not specific, we can interpret the vibration and the frequency in words, um, but we have a knowingness that comes that sometimes can't even be languaged. I just wanna encourage you, don't sit with, your, with this inside of you and wrestle with it. You don't have to wrestle with it. You can just take it up and say, you know what? I don't even know what to do with this. I don't, I'm, I'm perplexed why I'm even here during this you know, this is like something out of a movie. It doesn't even seem like it's really, re really, you know, a real happening, but it is, and it's okay. So don't be attached to it. Don't fight against it. Don't try to control it. That's the worst thing you can do. Trying to control, anytime you try to control a situation, you're attached to a situation being a certain way. Oh, that is a recipe for grief and pain because whatever you're resisting your muscles are pushing against it your inner being is pushing against it it's automatic pain it's automatic grief why would anybody want to do that just let go and let and go with the flow of the universe and i know that that sounds airy fairy but you have to trust your inner instincts you are connected you are not don't let anybody tell you oh you're, if you're disconnected you'd be dead Okay, so you are breathing, so you are connected. Okay, your spirit can never be disconnected. Even if you're in a coma, you're still connected. Your spirit will never be disconnected. Your body, as long as you're alive, is connected to your spirit and to the greater source of everything that ever has, is, and will be. So then just say, you know what, I don't even know how to do this. And my proof to you that this actually works is there have been atheists who have been captured under weird circumstances who are either journalists or businessmen or women who've been captured in far off places in the Middle East, 
who did not believe in a higher power. They were either agnostic or atheist. And in a moment of true desperation, you know, they had to give up. They were out of control because they were being controlled and they had to just give up and say, there's gotta be, you know, if there is a God, I don't know how to do this. I give up, I let go, I surrender. I wanna go with the flow. I don't see any way out, but there has to be a, a way out of this. Please help. And in that moment that you just like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go, I'm gonna trust that the universe has my back. I'm gonna trust that the universe has my best interest at heart, which it does. I'm just gonna choose to love myself because I'm pretty lovable. And I'm going to choose love, not fear. I'm not going to choose to think that I'm losing anything. I'm going to choose to think that when one door closes, another one opens. Because sometimes when this door closes, it's because maybe you don't want what's behind that door. So instead of resisting that that door is open and trying to push it open, you know what? It's much better to say that door is closed. Okay, so that's a sign to me that that's probably not the way to go. This door over here is open. Ah, okay, so now put your focus and attention over here and then continue to ask for signs. I hope this is giving you insight and gold nuggets of how to apply this in your daily, everyday life because this is how I'm applying it in my everyday life. I know for me, when I've learned all these different types of mystical and esoteric teachings, when it really came together from, for me, was either I had somebody who gave me one little bit of information, they either languaged it in such a way that it made a difference for me intellectually, either intellectually or some, somewhere in my heart, it just clicked where I knew, even though my brain hadn't quite wrapped itself around the concept yet, but my heart knew. And so once that happens, okay, then you put it into practice yourself and as you implement it, you're like, okay, I'm gonna try it this way. And then you get the results. The results are encouraging because you have a positive result. And you're like, ah, this is how this is done. When you know better, you do better. When you know better, you do better, okay? The history of peace gathering projects. So to date, the power of temporary peace gathering projects has been exhibited and thoroughly field tested in more than 50 demonstration projects and 23 peer-reviewed scientific studies scrutinized by independent scholars around the world. I'm gonna pause here again. So much information that's coming out like day to day. As of, as of this morning, there's over 100,000 people around the world who have been affected by Go Love 20. Go Love 20. If you don't know what Go Love 20 is, check in the description below. I'll put a link to Go Love 20. You can learn about it. If you have not been affected by Go Love 20, let me know. I'll see your name and I will do Go Love 20 on you. But over 100,000 people that have been affected by Go Love 20, uh, I believe in the next 24 hours, there's going to be um, a, net, a major network that is going to be actually interviewing Dr. Joe Dispenza, the author of this book. He's the one who started the Go Love 20. And there's um, a, a mutation from Go Love 20 to You Inspire Me, which I don't, I don't remember right now what the numbers of that are. But if you have not been affected by Go Love 20, just put your name in the description below and say, I want Go Love 20 and then I will message you and I will do a Go Love 20 on you so that you become affected, okay? This is closely tied to these global coherence gathering projects which have been going on around the world. We have had coherence meditations that are there every day all around the world. We have, it's unfreaking believable. And we have global coherence meditations, and then we have just regular coherence meditations. By definition, they're all global coherence meditations because there isn't any one that I've been on where it's just from one country. It's always from multiple continents. And the results are astonishing. 
this as of the publication of this book, which off the top of my head, I don't remember when this book was published, but it's been at least two, three years. So you can only imagine the data that is going to come out after we get out of this pandemic and things evolve. I'm not going to say that it's going to return to its normal state of being because there's no such thing. Time always moves forward. Life always moves forward, not backwards. So we are going to make no mistakes. Rest assured, we are going to evolve into a new, better and improved normal for the greater good of all. I'm choosing to ignore all the onerous, ominous, negative, scary garbage that's floating out there. And I'm choosing to focus on the, the new, normal evolution that is going to be for the greater good of all of us. I think that more human beings, more beings as a whole are going to come out aware, conscious, awakened, and improved as a result of this situation. I know that the earth is healing at a record rate to the point where here in Huntington Beach, we actually have bioluminescent water. We have red tides that occasionally happen. And so what happens at nighttime is that we have bioluminescent waves of water because of the di they're called dinoflagellates that are in the water. It's a ton of microorganisms that reflect water. And so the water is actually glowing in the dark and it's absolutely gorgeous. You can YouTube it and you can see all of it's, it's from San Diego all the way up to LA, all the way up to Santa Monica. It's this phenomena that's taking place in the water. It's really quite incredible. Okay, so that's already a benefit. The waters are clearer, the sky is clearer, the air is cleaner because less cars driving, less planes flying. So you see, this is, it's, it's for good. Okay, so the results have consistently demonstrated a positive effect in the immediate reduction of crime, warfare, and terrorism by an average of greater than 70%. Think about that for a moment. When a group of people come together with a specific intention or collective consciousness to change something or to produce an outcome, if they create it with the energy of emotions of peace, unity, or oneness without physically doing anything, that unified community can produce changes 70% of the time. So to quantify the results of these studies, scientists use a measurement called lead lag analysis. The purpose of lead lag analysis is to uncover correlations between people and incidents. So for example, if you looked at the lead lag analysis of a chain smoker, it would, it would show that the more a person smokes, the greater the chance will have of developing lung cancer. In relation to peace gathering projects, the studies have found that the greater the number of meditators or peace gatherers combined with the amount of time they meditate, the greater influence the gathering has upon decreasing incidences of crime and violence in our society. A powerful example is the Lebanon Peace Project, which brought together a group of meditators in Jerusalem in August and September of 1983 to demonstrate the radiating influence of peace. Although the number of meditators fluctuated over time, it was often large enough to achieve the super radiance effect for both Israel and nearby Lebanon. This effect happens when a group of specially trained meditators come together at the same time on a daily basis to create and radiate a positive effect on society. I'm going to read that again because I think that is such an awesome thing. This meditation group, it was often large enough to achieve the super radiance effect for both Israel and Lebanon, two countries. This effect happens when a group of specially trained meditators come together at the same time on a daily basis to create and radiate a positive effect on society. Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what we are doing. As you dive in deep, reading this book, learning this book, applying this book, 
all of my fellow mystics, all of us who are advanced students of Dr. Joe, even those who have not gone to his monastery, who are actively meditating, doing love coherence meditations. I think the best meditation that you could do is a heart love centered coherence meditation because love is the greatest frequency and it heals all things. It will put your autonomic nervous system to reset, to fire and wire everything in your body appropriately affecting the 50 trillion cells that you have in your body, the 50 billion DNA that you have in your body. Yes, we have 50 billion DNA in our body. And it is the ultimate frequency. I think that what is going to happen as a direct result of this particular time in 2020 is that we are going to see more forgiveness. We're going to see more loving. We're going to see more peace. We are going to see more serenity. We are going to see more, um, more allowing, more people allowing things to be because we have such a large army of meditators who understand that we're not gonna focus our time and attention on, you know, eradicating cancer, on, you know, getting rid of the COVID virus, on getting rid of multiple sclerosis or war or crime or, no. They're aware enough to know, no, we can't give our attention to those things. Our goal is to focus on love, to open our hearts. And it starts with anybody who's ever done anything to you to offend you, to um, who, who you don't feel good, um, either in their presence or as a result of your interaction with them. Um, it could be a family member, it could be a neighbor, it could be an acquaintance, it doesn't matter who it is, it could be somebody at a store, maybe somebody is having a bad day and you asked them an innocent question and they snapped at you and then you felt hurt by it. Just forgive and let go. It's not your fault that they snapped at you. They snapped at you, they were going to snap at anybody, you just happened to be the next person and boom, they were. And so you have to be able to forgive when you are able this is the beauty it's just like love when you love yourself and you have an open heart and you're able to truly love then you can allow love to come into your life because the, the world the universe the way it works is it's going to bring back love to you and that's why you have so many loving people in in your midst friends and family and the world really begins to love you and when, you, when your heart is closed, then because you don't love yourself, then you have persnickety, you know, grungy people who are like critical, judgmental, who are, you know, they don't uplift you. They bring you down because they're criticizing you. They're putting you down. They're, they're, they're not, they can't be loving with themselves. So how can they be loving with another? And that's not to say that, you know, no one's perfect, of course, because no one is perfect. That's why we need to forgive each other is because we are perfectly imperfect beings. Remember that we are perfectly imperfect beings. What does that mean to be perfectly imperfect? That means that you are perfect just the way you are. You don't need to change. You are not broken. Is there room for growth and self-improvement? Infinite completely infinite, but that doesn't mean you're not perfect. You are perfectly imperfect. And as you move forward and you grow and you try to, which is why we're doing this work. The reason why we're doing this work is because we want to grow. We want to become the better, purest version of ourselves. We want to ascend to higher levels where we can embrace the higher potentials of everything that we can be, do, and have, because we all have latent gifts that we haven't uncovered and we aspire to bring those to the surface, activate them so that we can use them not only for ourselves, we use it for ourselves and for the greater good of all. That's what this work is about. That's part of your healing, whether it's physically, emotionally, spiritually, or all of the above or all the different areas of your life. That's what this is all about.
there's a word that I want to share with you in Hebrew, which you may want to look up. And the word, and I love, in English, I speak multiple languages. As you know, there are nuances to language that are, sometimes you don't have words that fit exactly as a definition in one language to another. So for example, in English, we have the word, the word is perfect. And when you think of perfect, you think of, for example, like a square. If a square fits perfectly into, a square block would fit perfectly into a square hole. That means that it's perfect because there's precision with the exactitude with which that square block fits into that square opening. English, perfect. Spanish, perfecto. Um, Italian, perfecto. In Hebrew, we have the word tamim. What does tamim mean? It does mean perfect or perfection, but not the way we mean it in English, Italian, French, parfait, you know, in, in French. In uh, any of the Romance languages or in English, it's not the same meaning. It means perfection but it's perfection with a certain amount of fluidity or elasticity. So for example, I may not be the perfect mom in the entire world for all the children of the world, but I'm the tamim mom for my, my kids. The inference of the word tamim is that there's kind of a, there's a flexibility, there's a give and take, there's a fluidity that is not, it's not a static perfection, it's a dynamic perfection that as, as you are coming together with another person, just as I am with my kids, as I am with my kids, I can't be exactly the same with each one of my kids. I have, I can't be the same with my son as I am with my daughter. My daughter is a female. So I have to relate female to female with my daughter as to my son, you know, female to male. And my son, my three kids have a similar personality type, but yet they're three different personality types with three different temperaments. And so I have to appeal, I have to be flexible. I can't be a rigid drill sergeant and all of them the same, albeit I, my great, my grandmother on my father's side, my Italian grandma, she had seven kids and for her, all seven were the same. Boy, girl, didn't matter, all seven were the same. I'm not that way. I have that fluidity before I even was consciously aware of, aware of the word tamim. But I recognize that each child requires different care. And so as a mother, I am, intuitively sensitive to the needs of this kid. This child might need more, more praise or more encouragement than this one over here. You have to know what the currency of each child is. And the reason why I'm laughing is because as I'm saying this, I'm remembering how different the currency and the thing that motivated my first child, how differently it was with my second because my daughter, my son, he was the first one who came along super easy to um, parent and raise him because he's, you know, your A personality type, you know, eager to please and very status quo. I thought I was being a great parent and then I had my daughter and, you know, here she was three years old and giving me a run for the money and what worked for my son wasn't necessarily working with her and it was a little bit of more of a battle and so I really had to figure out what was her currency and it took me six years from birth to six years to figure out her currency. And then once I figured out her currency, then it was a lot smoother sailing. But I had to be different with my son than I was with her because I had to cater and appeal to her so that things would work out for her. It's critically important, I think, that we understand that word of perfect and perfection and recognize that we need to be fluid and malleable because as we give that fluidity, that malleability, that flexibility to others, 
then others are going to give that back to us. And that's really what we want. I, I don't know about you, but I know that I am not perfect by a long shot. And I know that I need grace. And so if I need grace, I have to give grace. So when I give you grace, then I know that the universe will give me grace back. And I think grace is, you know, like the twin brother of love. You know, love, I think love means that you have grace for another. When you, when you really love someone and someone is in your heart, like your child, is there something that your child would do that you wouldn't forgive? No, not at all. I mean, my child, you know, I love my child unconditionally. It's not contingent upon what they do. Even if they did the most horrific thing, I would hope that they would never do a horrific thing. But my child is my child. I'm going to love them. And that's that. It's a constant giving of grace. Now, I know that children don't oftentimes, I think some children do, but I think children, you know, what I've seen in the world is oftentimes kids don't give grace to their parents. I think because the parents haven't given them grace either. And so that's something that perhaps is missing. But I think that grace is an undervalued, under talked about energy and phenomena. And it's a gift. It's an unmerited gift that you give someone for no reason whatsoever. You gift it because you choose to gift it. And because a heart that is in a place of love and a, a heart that is healed and a heart that is whole can give grace to others. If your heart isn't healed and it hasn't, isn't whole, this is going to sound like, no, I can't do that. If I do that, that means I forgive them and that what they did was okay and I don't condone. No. Giving grace, forgiving them doesn't mean that you're saying what they did that harmed you was okay. It's saying that, you know what, I recognize that grace is, grace is needed here. I need to give you grace. I forgive you. I offer you grace. And it's okay. We all make mistakes. How many times have I done things that in retrospect, I go, gosh, maybe I shouldn't have done that, or maybe I shouldn't have said that, or maybe I shouldn't have retorted that way, or maybe I should have handled that a little differently. I don't know who it was who said it in history, but to err is human. Yeah, we're alive. We're human beings. We're going to make mistakes. Not a big deal. Get over it. Apologize. Move forward and be grown up to know that, you know what? We all make mistakes, and if you make a mistake, you apologize and you move on, not a big deal. The results of the two-month study showed that on the days when there was a high participation of meditators, a 76% reduction of war deaths occurred. Other effects included reduced crime, fires, decreased traffic accidents, less terrorism, and increases in economic growth. The results were then replicated in seven consecutive experiments over a two-year period during the peak of the Lebanon War. All of this was achieved simply by combining people's intention for peace and coherence with the elevated emotions of love and compassion. This clearly demonstrates that the more unified the consciousness of a group of people within a specific elevated energy is, the more it can change the consciousness and energy of others in a non-local way. So in what's considered one of the top three peace gathering studies in the Western Hemisphere, the Rand Corporation, which is a think tank, assembled a group of nearly 8,000 and sometimes more trained meditators to focus on world peace and coherence during three periods ranging from eight to 11 days each from 1983 to 1985. The results showed that during this time, worldwide terrorism was reduced by 72%. Pause. Okay, I hope you guys are starting to get, it's starting to click inside your brains why it's so important that we do the meditations, not just to heal our bodies. Make no mistakes, you're hitting two groups every time you do a meditation and you're healing yourself, you're healing yourself and you're healing the globe. I would encourage you, if you haven't started meditating, start meditating now. Heal yourself because as you heal yourself, it's automatically as you put 
embrace that love within you, you're also healing the world. And you can be part of this 72 to 76% of people who benefit from this, where we have a reduction in crime, deaths, everything I, you know, I read here before, okay? So that should give you more motivation. It's gonna get your mojo, mojo up, okay? So can you imagine the results and positive effects as well as the speed with which they would occur if this type of meditation and mindfulness was part of the education curriculum? In still another study, this time in India, from 1987 to 1990, 7,000 people gathered to focus on world peace. During that three-year period, the world witnessed remarkable transformations towards world peace. The Cold War ended, the Berlin Wall came down, the Iran-Iraq War came to an end, South Africa began to move towards abolishing apartheid, and terrorist attacks subsided. What surprised everyone was the swiftness with which these global changes occurred, all in a relatively peaceful manner. My encouragement to you is that the same thing can happen right now. We're in the middle of this right now because we have over 70,000 people, I think it's over 100,000 people right now that are actively meditating every day, focusing on love. My dream, and I know it's gonna happen like this, my dream is that we would have a million meditators across the globe that will come together and say, you know what? I'm gonna take 15 minutes a day. I'm going to spread love from my heart to the rest of the universe for just 15 minutes a day. I'm gonna pick one person a day. Mind you, when you pick one person a day to give love to, you're not only influencing them, you're influencing the entire globe as well. It, there's, it's impossible to limit it to just that one person. So I wanna encourage you, if you want me to put a meditation in the description, I'll put a link to a meditation so that you can start to implement that right now. If you don't have Go Love 20 yet, again, I can't emphasize it enough. I would love to be the person that will affect you with the Go Love 20. And we'll, we'll just leave it at that. In 1993, 27 years ago, from June 7th to July 30th, approximately 2,500 meditators gathered in Washington, D.C. in a highly controlled experiment to focus on peace and coherent energy. For the first five months of the year, violent crime had been steadily on the rise. Yet soon after the study began, a significant statistical reduction in violence as measured by the FBI Uniform Crime Reports, crime and stress in Washington, D.C. began to occur. These results point to the fact that a relatively small group of people united in love and purpose can have a statistically significant effect on a diverse population. So on September 11th, 2001, due to the immediacy of global media, human beings all over the planet felt horror, shock, fear, terror, and grief as planes crashed into the New York City's World Trade Center the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and the field near Shanksville, Pennsylvania. So in an instant, the world's collective consciousness tuned in to this event. Powerful emotional outpourings around the globe occurred as people bonded, formed communities, and took care of one another. During the unfolding of events on 9-11, scientists at Princeton's universities Global Conscious Project were collecting data via the internet from more than 40 devices around the world. As a data poured into a central server in Princeton, New Jersey, the scientists witnessed dramatic changes in the patterns in their random event generator. Think of a random event generator as a computerized coin toss. It's measuring heads or tails or ones and zeros. So according to statistics, it should produce nearly 50-50 results. The dramatic changes in patterns right after the event caused the scientists to determine that the collective emotional response of people's outpouring was enough that it could actually be measured in the Earth's magnetic field. 
What all of these studies ultimately pointed to is that there's significant evidence that group meditations of the right size with skilled meditators who change their emotions and energy can influence and create non-local measurable effects on peace and global coherence. So if these peace gathering projects are a force for coherence throughout a society, are there antithetical forces that could be working against humans to produce incoherence? The Earth's relationship to solar cycles. So as the Earth rotates daily on its axis, every morning the sun brings light to the darkness and warmth and comfort to the chill of the night. Photosynthesis to plants and security to humans. It's for that reason that as far back as 14,000 BCE, adoration of the sun has been sketched onto stone tablets and cave walls. Countless mythologies, including civilizations in ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, the Mayans and the Aztecs and the Australian Aborigines, to name just a few, have extolled the sun as worthy of worship, as well as a source of enlightenment, illumination, and wisdom. So no matter the location, most cultures have recognized the sun as the prime controller of all life on earth because without it, life here could not exist. So for the most part, humans, electromagnetic beings, entities that constantly send and receive messages via vibrational energies, whose bodies are made up of gravitationally organized light and information, in fact, Everything material in this three-dimensional world is gravitationally organized light and information. Just as we are individual electromagnetic beings, we are but a small link in the chain of electromagnetic world, the individual parts of which cannot be separated from the whole. Now read that again, because I think that's critically important. Just as we are individual electromagnetic beings, we are but a small link in the chain of electromagnetic world, the individual parts of which cannot be separated from the whole. So again, there's proof that you, as an electromagnetic being, we each make up a part of this electromagnetic field that makes up the globe, the world's electromagnetic field. The globe, the earth itself has an electromagnetic field on its own. And we are inside that electromagnetic field and we cannot be disconnected from that electromagnetic field. We are permanently linked to that electromagnetic field. On a grand scale, it is impossible to deny the interconnectivity between the sun's energy, the earth's energy, and the energy of all species. On a micro level, all you have to do is look at the life cycle of a fruit or vegetable to understand this interdependence. The vegetable or fruit begins as a seed. And when environmental conditions such as water, temperature, nutrient rich soil, and photosynthesis conspire, these conditions enable the seed to germinate. Eventually the blossom of the seed becomes an integral part of an ecosystem as well as a source of sustenance and nourishment for various forms of life. This complex chain and delicate balance of events all begins with the Earth's uniquely situated location in our solar system, known as the circumstellar habitable zone. This is a range of orbital distance around a star, our sun, in which a planet can support liquid water. While the sun may be almost 93 million miles away, when it, comes, when it becomes active, it has significant consequences to life on Earth because the Earth and the sun are related by electromagnetic fields. So the purpose of the Earth's electromagnetic field is to protect it from the harmful effects of solar radiation and sunspots, cosmic rays, and other forms of space and weather. So although not totally understood, Sunspots are relatively dark, cool areas of the sun that are caused by interactions with the sun's magnetic field. 
they can be up to 32,000 miles in diameter, you can think of sunspots as a cap on a seltzer bottle. If you shake the bottle and then remove the cap, it's going to produce a large release of photons and other forms of high frequency radiation. The Earth's electromagnetic field. If it were not for the protection and insulation of the Earth's electromagnetic fields, life as we know it could not exist, for we would be constantly bombarded by a steady stream of deadly particles. So for example, when there are solar flares, the Earth's electromagnetic field protects the planet by deflecting trillions of tons of photonic emissions called mass coronal ejections. Pause. I don't know about you, but that caught my attention. First two times I read this book, of course we didn't have the coronavirus, virus, but now I see this called the mass coronal ejections. Coronavirus, coronal. Is there a link here? I don't know, but it made me raise an eyebrow. So I would love to hear in the comments below if this is making you go, mass coronal ejections are huge explosions of plasma. Hmm. I don't know if there's anything to follow up here, but let's see. So mass coronal ejections are huge explosions of plasma and magnetic fields from the sun's corona. Corona means crown, by the way that can extend billions of miles into space. Their effects tend to reach the Earth an average of 24 to 36 hours after they occur. These ejections compress the Earth's field, heating the Earth's iron core. As this core becomes altered, it changes the planet's electromagnetic field. And these ejections are a part of solar cycles that occur approximately every 11 years and they have the potential to disturb all living organisms on the earth. So the recording of solar cycles began in 1755, but in 1915, an 18-year-old Russian boy named Alexander Chizevsky took mankind's understanding of the sun and its relation to the earth to the next level, when he spent his summer observing the sun. During the summer, he began hypothesizing that periods of solar activity might have effects on the organic world. A year later, he entered World War I, and when not fighting for Russia, he again cast his observations towards the sun. He noticed in particular that battles tend to wax or wane depending on the strength of solar flares. See graphic 14 in the color insert. Chizevsky later compiled the histories of 72 countries from 1749 to 1926, comparing the annual number of important political and social events, such as the starts of wars, revolutions, outbreaks of diseases, and violence with increased solar activity, demonstrating a correlation between the sun's activity and human excitability. Equally interesting, solar activity has also been associated with great human flourishing. Ooh, including innovations in architecture, science, the arts, and social change. Whoa. So uh, it begs to ask the question here, is that what's going on right now? Perhaps we are having one of these solar sunspots and we have this increased solar activity, which is creating this whole situation, which is, it's interesting how we have this polarity. He says here, such as, such as the start of wars, revolutions, outbreaks of disease, violence, etc., with increased solar activity, demonstrating a correlation between the sun's activity and human excitability. Equally interesting, solar activity has also been associated with great human flourishing, including innovations in architecture, science, arts, and social change. I think that's what's happening right now. I think there are great human flourishings, innovations, architecture, science, social change. There's all sorts of things that are starting to unfold right now. Those of us who have chosen not to wait for things to quote, get back to normal, because I know they're not gonna go back to normal. I know we are evolving into a new and improved new normal. That, that will become our new normal. And those of us 
who are aware of that and are embracing that and you're actively taking measures to adapt change into our daily lives and do things differently think of things differently ask for the divine to give us revelation to think outside of the box and more important than all of those things to be energetically and spiritually sensitive to feel to feel sense and know in realms that are not normally easily accessible to you so that you have a greater sense of knowingness and in doing so you're able to serve people far better i got to tell you from my own personal experience there are things that i have known that i have no idea how i've known because they're not from my memory it's not any any knowledge that was stored in my brain and it was only because i came into a space where i was able to in a quick moment get into a heart and brain coherent state and for the benefit of who the you know the person that i'm guiding and i'm dealing with in order to be of service to them i'm willing to open and to surrender to that knowledge which is not my own and pay attention to what's being said and then as i reveal what's being said then and i don't know if what's being said is going to be rejected because they they can lie and say oh no because they might want to protect themselves which i can feel as well but you want you know i i think one of the things that as humans we always have to do is you have to present you, i really have always felt that preserving and protect, protecting another person's dignity is very important there's no circumstance under which another person's dignity shouldn't be preserved i think you you should preserve and respect another person's dignity so if somebody's not willing to fess up to something in that moment it's not your job to crack them open it's like give them the space you know what you know give them time and some people won't in any amount of time they're just they're like this they're not going to open up and if that's them that's them you know okay but a lot of people will over time they'll soften up and they'll see that it's safe and then they'll say well yeah I, i told you that that wasn't true but in actuality this is true and it's like okay now they feel safe enough to say so and that's that's totally fine we're human like i said before we're human you're opening yourself up to the divine so that you are now what the a lot of the ancient scriptures talk about you having an open and cleansed vessel when you are an open cleansed vessel you get out of your own way you put your ego and your brain to the side which is Dr. Joe is brilliant at languaging and expressing that so that you recognize your higher self your awareness your consciousness especially your focused conscious awareness versus your brain and your ego which sometimes can lead you it's only going to give you the same results of the past because you're going to your brain is a record of the past your body is a you know your the language of the brain it are thoughts and the language of the body are emotions and your body is a record of past thoughts feelings and emotions it's all in the past so in order to create something different in the future you have to consciously command your brain to be different and you have to command your brain to order your autonomic nervous system you have to on purpose link and sync your left and right hemisphere if you're wondering how do i do that i have a health neuro reset you can look on my uh, channel it's a guided meditation it's about it's just under 3 minutes long so you can do that if you prefer to have a private guided meditation then contact me below but really the guided meditation on there should suffice should be sufficient for you but you want to link and sync the right and left hemisphere of your brain so now that you have both hemispheres firing and wiring correctly now you can create a new path for yourself you can now charge your brain to charge and command your autonomic nervous system and now you can continue to move forward and create the life that you want and in this moment just your the evidence that you are putting your hands on the steering wheel of your life and you're starting to decide i'm going to go left i'm going to go right i'm going to go straight ahead and now you're really starting to create what you want is the evidence is that you're reading this book 
and you're studying it and you're applying it and you're seeking. And I want you to get out of the seeking. You don't have to seek anymore. You have found some of the information. You're on the path. Everything that you ever need, need, ever wanted to know is inside you and you're going to access. Now you're being shown how you can access the infinite source of intelligence. Every thought that ever has been past, present and future. Yes, make no mistakes. You're also going to access the thoughts from the future because that infinite source intelligence isn't bound by time. They don't measure things in time. It, everything just is simultaneously. That's why you're able to link and tap into that knowledge from any realm, any dimension, from any time period. That's the, it's the beauty of it. It's a hard concept I know sometimes to wrap your head around, but just forget about it. Just know that it all exists simultaneously. It's all in the now. So every place where you see the red line spiking in the graph represents an active solar flare or sunspot that occurred between the years 1750 and 1922. The blue lines represent historically important events that took place within the same period. Chavesky eventually determined that 80% of the country's most significant events occurred during solar events and geomagnetic activity. The solar release of energy, which is always carrying information, seems to be in almost perfect coherence with the activities, the energy, and the consciousness of our planet. That's not a coincidence. It just so happens that at the time of this writing in 2017, okay, so that's when this book was written, was 2017, we are in the midst of a very active solar cycle. Well, there's your answer. I don't remember reading that the last two times, but here we are. It's on the record. We are in the midst of a very, very active solar cycle. It's no wonder this is going on right now. So in the past decade, much has been said about how the solar energy is affecting the planet and all the life that inhabits in it. In 12, 2012, doomsayers thought the end of the Mayan calendar, which correlates to December solstice, meant the end of the world was at hand. Today, astrologers talk about the age of Aquarius, and the astrological age is a period consisting of approximately 2,150 years that corresponds to the average time it takes for the vernal equinox to move from one constellation of the zodiac into the next, and how it will usher in a new awareness for humanity. So astronomers and cosmologists talk about galactic alignment, a rare astronomical event occurring every 12,960 years that bring the sun into alignment with the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Isn't that odd? So regardless of what you believe, all of these occurrences point to the solar cycles that increase the energy coming, from, coming toward the Earth from the sun since we are electromagnetic beings connected to the earth through electromagnetic fields and shielded from the sun by electromagnetic fields this increase in energy from the sun is going to change both the energy of the earth and our personal energy this means that this new energy has the potential to influence human beings in either positive or negative ways depending on our individual energy so for example, if you are feeling separation, living by survival modes and survival emotions and enslaved to the hormones and chemicals of stress, your brain and heart are going to fire incoherently. This will cause your energy and awareness to become divided and out of balance. And the energy in, and the increase in energy from the sun is going to enhance the state of being. Therefore, if you are living in incoherence, that incoherence is going to become amplified. And by the same means, if you are living in the coherent alignment of head and heart, working daily in your meditations to connect to the unified field and to overcome your limited beliefs and attitudes, you're going to be propelled even further into the truth and understanding of who you are and what your purpose is. So the bottom line is that we are in the midst of an imitation, no, 
Sorry about that. The bottom line is that we are in the midst of an initiation and it is going to take a tremendous amount of will, awareness and consciousness to stay focused so as to not succumb to these excitable energies. If we can maintain our focus then, instead of being victims of uncertainty, we can transmute this energy into greater degrees of orderliness, coherence, and even peace, both personally and globally. Pause. Okay, I'm going to talk to, here, to the aspect here of uncertainty, because as human beings, we like the predictable. We like to have certainty. We like to have guarantees. We like, we like what's known. And mo many human beings don't like the unpredictable future. Now, the truth of the matter is no one has control. No one has control of anything from one perspective. I remember when my kids were little and I don't know why I watched this movie I was watching with my son, the movie Fantasia, which is all animation and, you know, Mickey Mouse is the warlock and he's just, you know, moving his magic wands everywhere. And I don't know what it was in that movie that sparked the dark thought that there was no guarantee that I was going to be around to, to see my son grown up, finish raising him. And I, that thought, it was a dark thought in the middle of this Fantasia Disney movie, which is for kids. And I remember just as quickly getting angry. It's like, what do you mean there's no guarantees that I'm gonna be here, you know, in the future to raise him? And it's like, I have to be here to raise him. And then as I, you know, once I went to bed and I started, I, I pondered that thought a little bit more after the movie because for some reason that was upon me. And I remember thinking, well, that's not cool that, you know, yeah, the past is guaranteed because it's already past. This moment right now is guaranteed. It's right here, right now. But I have no way of guaranteeing that I'm gonna wake up in the morning, none. The likelihood is that I'm gonna wake up in the morning. The likelihood is that I'm gonna see the sun rise or that the sun will rise. But is there, can anybody give me a 100% guarantee that I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning? No, nobody can. We have plenty of examples where that hasn't been the case, you know, or whatever. I'm not going to get into the different examples because we don't want to go down that dark rabbit hole. But the truth of the matter is nobody is guaranteed tomorrow. Nobody. There's not a single person alive that is guaranteed tomorrow. This moment right now, is the past is guaranteed because it's already happened but the future I, part of me thinks that the future is what you make of it so if you see doom and gloom in the future then i think that you're going to attract doom and gloom into your future if you think that the future is hopeful and bright and that great things are coming then i think that that's what you create and that's what you bring bring upon you do you think that this is a love-filled, grace-filled planet and that people embrace love in their hearts and that overall most people are good than they are bad, then I think that's what you are going to see. If you think the opposite, then either way you're going to be right because it's whatever you focus on, that's where you get your attention to, that's what's going to grow, and that's what you magnetize yourself to electromagnetically because that's the electromagnetic field that you're creating and that's going to attract others, you know, birds of a feather flock together. So something to think about, but I do believe that although we, we are uncomfortable with uncertainty, I think those of us who have finally understood what meditation, the practice of connecting your heart and your mind so that they are one, so that you can reach the divine and connect to infinite source intelligence, we realize that you actually do create things in 5D. And so even though you cannot predict with complete certainty specifics, you can definitely, the overall picture is a bright picture. It's a favorable, it's a favorable one. It's something that you do want because you're going to create in 5D what you do want, not what you don't want.
I mean, if you're focusing on what you don't want in 5D, then of course that's what's, because you're worried about this, so then you're going to create more things that are going to get you more worried. But if you have understood that it's like, okay, no, I'm going to create what I do want, as in my example of when I was walking that 50 foot plank, I didn't want my legs to shake. So I said, legs, stop shaking. And I'm going to pull all my energy, every cell of my body, like, like a laser now. I'm going to focus it on this one task. I need to be steady, Eddie, walk across this plank. Again, can't begin to emphasize enough how important it is to focus on what you want and not to fear what you don't want. Instead of being victims of uncertainty, we can transmute this energy into greater degrees of orderliness, coherence, and even peace, both personally and globally. In the simplest terms, this energy is going to endorse who you are being. That is how you are thinking and feeling. The Schumann resonance. So in 1952, German physicist and professor W.O. Schumann hypothesized there were measurable electromagnetic waves in the atmosphere in the cavity or space between the Earth's surface and the ionosphere. And according to NASA, the ionosphere is an abundant layer of electrons, ionized atoms, and molecules that stretches from approximately 30 miles above the surface of the Earth to the edge of space about 600 miles up. It's a large area. This dynamic region grows, it grows and it shrinks and further divides into subregions based on solar conditions and it's a critical link in the chain of the sun and earth interactions. So it is this celestial power station that makes radio communications possible. So that's interesting. It's from 30 miles from the earth to 600 miles off the earth's surface and it's shrinking. So it's, it's a, a dynamic field. It shrinks, it expands and contracts basically. So in 1954, Schumann and H.L. Koenig confirmed Schumann's hypothesis by detecting resonances at a main frequency of 7.83 Hertz. Thus, the Schumann resonance was established by measuring global electromagnetic resonances generated and excited by lightning discharges in the ionosphere. So you can think of this frequency as a tuning fork in, you know, for life. In other words, it acts as a background frequency influencing the biological circuitry of the mammalian brain, the subconscious brain below the neocortex, which is also the home of the autonomic nervous system. The Schumann frequency affects our body's balance, health, and very nature as mammals. In fact, the absence of the Schumann resonance can cause serious mental and physical health issues in the human body. This was demonstrated through research by German scientist Rutger Weaver from the Max Planck Institute for Behavioral Physiology in Erling and Ex, Germany. In the study, he took young healthy volunteers for four weeks at a time and placed them hermetically sealed underground bunkers that screened out the Schumann frequency and throughout the four weeks the students ooh, throughout the four weeks the students circadian rhythms changed causing them to suffer emotional distress and migraine headaches whoa I'm gonna read that again because I think there's more clues here in the study he took young healthy student volunteers for four weeks at a time and placed them Four weeks, quarantine. Quarantine comes from the word quaresma. Quaresma means, quor it's basically the root word is four, which is for 40 days. Four weeks at a time and placed them in hermetically sealed underground bunkers that screened out the Schumann frequency. Throughout the four weeks, the students' circadian rhythms changed, causing them to suffer emotional distress and migraine headaches. When Weaver introduced the Schumann frequency back into the bunkers, after only a brief exposure to 7.83 Hertz, the volunteers' health returned to normal. Hmm. 
So my intuition is telling me here to bring to your attention that if you are having a disruption in your sleep cycle, if you are having migraines, if you are having just an uneasy feeling in your body in any way, shape or form, gee whiz, it's possible, it's possible that you might benefit from maybe, maybe finding a YouTube video where they play a 7.83 Hertz Schumann resonance uh, music music and meditation and maybe you might want to go to sleep to the 7.83 hertz music residence in fact i'm going to point you towards i know that brian scott does a lot of um he has a lot of fantastic meditations and he uses um, multiple different frequencies um, but check to see if he has uh, maybe a meditation where it's all Schumann resonance. I don't know. I know that he has usually three, four, five different resonances in his meditations because he lists them and all of his music is by Metahertz. So you might want to look up Metaverse and see if Metaverse yeah. has music that's just all Schumann resonance with 7.83 Hertz. So just a tip. So if you are having headaches, if you are having migraines, if you're having your sleep disruptions where you're not sleeping through the night or, or insomnia or, or just general uneasiness or not feeling well, I think you might want to play this Schumann Resonance. And I don't have any Schumann Resonance music that I can offer you that I've created myself. Uh, I, I am a musician and I do create some music, but I have not. But now it's kind of making me think I probably should. So I'll have to see. Another thing on my long list of things to do. <laughs> as far back as we know, the Earth's electromagnetic field has been protecting and supporting all living things with this natural frequency pulsation of 7.3 Hertz. 7.83 Hertz, Schumann resonance. So you can think of the Schumann resonance as the Earth's heartbeat. The ancient Indian rishis referred to this as own or the incarnation of pure sound whether by coincidence or not 7.83 hertz also happens to be a very powerful frequency used with brain wave entrainment as it is associated with low levels of alpha and the upper range of theta brain wave states it is this range of brain waves that allows us to get beyond the analytical mind and into the subconscious Thus, this frequency has also been associated with high levels of suggestibility, meditation, increased human growth hormone levels, and increased cerebral blood flow levels. It appears then that the Earth's frequency and the brain's frequency have very similar resonances and that our nervous system can be influenced by the Earth's electromagnetic field. Perhaps this is why getting out of the city and into nature often provides such a calming effect. One of the reasons why I'm so drawn to the water and I've always lived by the beach, I consider myself an island girl because as you know, Sicily is an island, I lived in Puerto Rico for three years, that's an island. Um, I'm here in Huntington Beach, blocks from the water. Um, there's something about the feel of just being close to the water, the energy of the waves, something about my, my eyes physically have to see the water. There's something that happens to me inside when I actually look at the water. And as I understand energy, I understand now that there's actually an energetic exchange that's going on there. So it's not just an airy fairy thing, but I physically have the need to actually look into the waves and to see the waves with my eyes. There's, it's almost like there, there's like an, a, like an electromagnetic waves that are where it's like, like it's a completeness that's going on. That's, I think, part of the evidence of the Schumann resonance. Also, as you, you may or may not know this, but if you put your feet in the water when you're at the beach, you don't have to fully submerge your body. Just you're putting your feet in the water up to, you can go up to your knees, up to your waist, it doesn't matter, but just having your feet on the sand, getting your feet in the water automatically grounds you electromagnetically. And your body receives a lot of benefit from being you know, grounded. So putting your feet on the grass, 
Putting your feet on dirt will also do that. But the benefit of doing it in the, in the seawater when you're at the beach is that you have a lot of iodine and you have all the natural minerals that are in the seawater because your feet, if you don't know this, be aware that your feet have the largest pores in your entire body. So as you are grounding yourself with your feet in the water, you are also detoxing yourself from whatever toxins you might have your body because that's coming out through the bottom of your feet as your feet are in the water, which is why some people, I know that in Sicily and in Puerto Rico, they tell you, it's like, if you have a cold, go to the beach, go to the beach and just bathe yourself that the iodine and the minerals in the water will clear your lungs and will, will clear you. It'll make you whole again. You'll feel better. And sure enough, you go, go into the water. As soon as you go into the water, you're fine. That's why if you know surfers, you'll see that most surfers, they don't get sick. They don't get colds. They don't, it's very rare because they're constantly getting grounded. They're constantly being, their bodies are being nourished by the iodine, the natural occurring minerals, calcium, there's a lot of benefits from that beach water. So yes, it can dry your skin if you're out there too long, but there's a lot of very healing energies and there's you know the electromagnetic fre frequency that's inherent to the water, to the beach water, because it's such a large body of water, the ocean. I don't know if it causes any coherence in your body, but I'm gonna have to look that up. I never thought of that before until right now, but maybe that's another element. But like I said, just looking at the water I know benefits me and I would venture to say it probably benefits you too. So if you live close, just go look at the water. Believe it or not, that will, that has a very healing, a very um, calming, a very nurturing. It does feed you, okay? So the concept of emergence. So in 1996, researchers at the HeartMath Institute discovered that when an individual's heart is in a state of coherence or harmonious rhythm, it radiates a more coherent electromagnetic signal into the environment and that this signal can be detected by the nervous system of other people as well as animals. So in fact, as you know by now, the heart generates the strongest magnetic field in the body and it can be measured several feet away. So this provides credible explanation for the fact that when someone walks into a room, you can feel or sense that individual's mood or emotional state, independent of their body language. So from a purely scientific standpoint, we can then ask, if this phenomenon works on an individual level, can it work on a global level? Well, in 2008, more than a decade later, the Heart Math Institute launched the Global Coherence Initiative, GCI for short, a science-based international effort that seeks to help activate the heart of humanity to promote peace, harmony, and a shift in global consciousness. So GCI is based on the beliefs that human health, thoughts, behaviors, and emotions are influenced by solar geomagnetic, the Earth's magnetic field activity. So the Earth's magnetic field is a carrier of biologically relevant information that connects all living systems. So all human beings influence the Earth's electromagnetic field of vital information. So collective human consciousness, where large numbers of people are intentionally focused on heart-centered states, creates or affects the global information field. Therefore, elevated emotions of care, love, and peace can generate a more coherent field an environment that can benefit others and help offset the current planetary discord and incoherence. Planetary discord and incoherence can actually be healed through these coherence meditations because human heart rhythm and brain frequencies, as well as cardiovascular and autonomic nervous systems overlap with the Earth's resonance field, GCI scientists suggest that we are part of a biological feedback loop in which we not only receive relevant biological information from the field, but we also feed information into this field. In other words, human thoughts, consciousness and emotions, the energy that's coming from your heart, interact with the ENCODE, this information into the Earth's magnetic field. 
And this information is then distributed on carrier waves, the signal on which the information is impressed or carried around the globe. So to further their research and test this hypothesis using state-of-the-art sensors located in various locations around the globe, the HeartMath Institute created the Global Coherence Monitoring System, GCMS, to observe changes in the Earth's magnetic field. It's designed to measure the global coherence. The GCMS uses a system of highly sensitive magnetometers to continuously measure magnetic signals that occur in the same range as the human physiological frequencies, including our brain and cardiovascular systems. They also continuously monitor activity caused by solar storms, flares, and solar wind speed activity resulting from, from solar storms, disruptions of the Schumann resonances, and potentially the signatures of major global events that have a strong emotional component. So why are they doing this and what does it point to? If you can intentionally create a coherent electromagnetic field around your body and you are related or connected to someone in your life who is also intentionally creating an electromagnetic field around their body, the waves of this shared field would begin to synchronize in a non-local way. Hmm. As the waves from both individuals synchronize, they generate bigger waves and stronger magnetic fields around you, connecting you to the Earth's ele electromagnetic field with an increased field of influence. So if we could create a community of people scattered all over the world, which we have, with each individual intentionally raising the energy of their own personal field towards greater peace, isn't it possible that this community could begin to produce a global effect within the Earth's electromagnetic field, this intentional community could then create coherence where there is incoherence and order where there is and has been disorder. The evidence from the peace gathering study suggests that our thoughts and feelings do in fact have a measurable effect on every living system. You may have heard of this as the concept of emergence. Envision the synchronicity of a school of fish or a flock of birds flying in unison where all creatures appear to be operating from one mind, connected by an indiv invisible field of energy in a non-local way. What is unique about this phenomena is that it is not a top-down phenomenon, meaning there's no leader. Instead, it's a bottoms-up phenomenon, meaning everyone is leading because they are acting as one mind. When a global community comes together in the name of peace, love, and coherence, according to emergence, we should be able to produce an effect in the Earth's electromagnetic field, as well as in each other's fields. So when a global community comes together in the name of peace, love, and coherence, according to the emergence, we should be able to produce an effect in the Earth's electromagnetic field, as well as in each other's fields. So just imagine then what it would be like if we were all behaving, living, thriving, and operating as one. If we understood we were of one mind, one organism, connected and united through consciousness, we would understand that to hurt another or affect another in any way is to do the same to ourselves. This new paradigm in thinking would be the largest evolutionary leap our species has ever made, causing the need for warring, fighting, competing, fearing, and suffering to become an antiquated concept. But how could this possibility become a reality? Coherence versus incoherence. In order for us to create some type of effect in the Earth's field, which in turn can influence another's individual field, as you might guess, we have to activate two significant centers in the human body, the heart and the brain. As we learned in chapter four, while the brain is of course the center of consciousness and awareness, the heart, the center of oneness, wholeness, and our connection to the unified field has its own brain. So when people can regulate their internal states of care, 
kindness, peace, love, gratitude, thankfulness, and appreciation, as their hearts become more coherent, more balanced, they send a very strong signal to the brain, causing the brain to become more coherent and balanced. This is because the heart and the brain are in continuous communication with each other. By the same means, once someone moves beyond the association to their body, their environment, and time takes their attention off matter and objects, they become nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, and no time. And as you well understand by now, when they get beyond themselves and put their awareness on the immaterial world of energy, they connect to the unified field, the place where no longer separation between the body and anyone, anything, and anywhere, and any time. This causes them to unify with the consciousness of everybody, everyone, everything, everywhere, and every time. As a consciousness, they have now entered the quantum field of energy and information, the place where consciousness and energy can influence the material world in non-local ways. So what does this mean when it says that energy can influence the material world in non-local ways? What that means is that when you are in that heart and brain coherence, you have both of these now that are they're connected. Now you go into 5D. You're going into a place where you're no one, nobody, nothing, nowhere, no place, and no time. Because you don't identify now. When you're in that place, you don't feel your body. You don't feel your hands. You don't feel your feet. You feel you are just in the space. You are in that blackness. And you are aware of the space and the void above you, below you, to the side, in front of you, behind you. You are just that awareness of the void and of that blackness. And in that space, you can mold the energy and you are non-local at that point in time. So whatever resources that you have, i.e. money in the bank, i.e. a loved one, i.e. help for your business, i.e. a job, whatever label you want to give it, doesn't matter what it is. It could be a car, you need to buy a car. It might be a bicycle. Again, the material, as far as the energy is concerned, it's all matter. Whether it's a piece of a pen, or whether it's a drink, or whether it's, uh, like I said, it could be a coconut water, it could be a pen, it could be a button or a, a castle, as Abraham Hicks says, doesn't make to the universe to the quantum world of energy it's all the same to create something takes the same amount of energy and it's all the same i want to point something out because when you realize this you're like yeah you could see how in the quantum it doesn't care it's indiscriminate it's like whatever you want that's fine so whether you choose to create okay so if you're creating in quantum and you decide okay i'm just going to manifest one dollar it's one bill one dollar i just want to manifest one dollar got a thinner and then lo and behold a stranger shows up and gives you a one dollar bill for no reason or you find a one dollar bill on the floor great one dollar to quantum and we don't have five hundred dollar bills in america anymore the greatest denomination we have is five five uh, we don't have 500, 100 is the maximum, but I'm just to, you know, bring it to light. 500, a bill that's 500, it's still a bill, right? So the writing is 500 zero, zero versus one. Do you think the quantum cares as far as it's, as it's concerned? It's a piece of paper is a piece of paper, whether you have one or here you can see it. Okay, so whether it's one or 500, it doesn't care. No different than, let's say you're not thinking of it as bills and you're thinking of it as, maybe you're thinking of the digital representation of your bank account on your cell phone. Well, whatever, whether it's one digit, two digits, three digits, six digits, seven digits, do you think that the energy cares to it? They're just digits on a screen. To you, you give it so much significance, but to the divine, it's digits on a screen. It's no more difficult to create one thing versus the other. So 
whatever you think, whatever you focus, whatever you believe that it is that you can have, you can have. But if you don't think you can, then you obviously can't. And I also wanted to address the issue of non-local because those things that you want typically are not present here where you're sitting right now. Otherwise you wouldn't want them. When you are creating in 5D, it's, it's not limited to the address where you're at, the room that you're at, to the city that you're in. No, it's creating in 5D irrespective of where you are. So wherever you are and the person, place, or thing it is that you want, it doesn't care because it doesn't see, it doesn't see um, the difference in geographical locations or everything is, you know, as we talked before, there's the difference between time, space and space time. So it's, it's completely non-local. Everything just is. The more coherence you can achieve through the elevated emotions of the heart, the more the heart and the brain will synchronize. So the more the brain and the heart will synchronize. So the key, because the heart is thousands of times more electromagnetic, has so much more information, has a brain of its own. It's far more powerful than the electromagnetic waves of the brain. The more you can connect to your heart, open up your heart, literally visualize your heart opening up in your meditations. One of the things that I started doing not too, not too long ago, I started doing this was picturing a magnifying glass on my heart so that that um, heart coherence is magnified. And so I want that energy to be magnified, amplified. So I have more open heart. So I have more of the energy going up into my brain, being radiated out into my electromagnetic field. Because I know that that electromagnetic field is not just affecting me, it's also connected to the Earth's magnetic field and all the beings that are on this electromagnetic grid. So that all beings, human beings, plants, animals, all beings, I don't care what kind of being it is. Does that make sense? Okay, so this synchronization produces measurable effects not only within the body, but also within the electromagnetic field surrounding the body. And the bigger the field we produce around our body, the more we can affect others in a non-local way. So how do we know this? Because we've seen this over and over again in our students that have HRV measurements, evidence of the influence of the heart's electromagnetic field upon the field of another's heart can also be seen in the heart, heart math study in which 40 participants were divided into groups of four around 10 card tables. While the heart rhythms of all four participants at the table were being measured, only three people were trained to raise their emotions through heart math techniques. When the three trained participants raised their energy and sent positive feelings to the untrained participant, that person also went into higher states of coherence. So the authors of the study concluded that the evidence of heart to heart synchronization across subjects was found, which leads and lends credence to the possibility of heart to heart biocommunications. I think that's so exciting. This is why distance healing works. You don't have to be in the same room, you know, a healer doesn't have to be in the same room with the subject in order for the subject to heal. I've had so many people all over the world who I've been able to guide them through certain processes and they've been healed of all sorts of things. And it's, I never take that for granted. Um, I'm always stunned and I always expect it, 
Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not attached to it. I allow it to be knowing that it may or may not be. And it may not, it may, I may never find out if it actually worked for them or not. However, it's always astonishing to me every the numbers, you know, so many times people are like, oftentimes instantly, they're like, oh, my headache is gone. Or, you know, I had a lady who, um, she was in a studio where they were filming and she had one of the, I can't imagine how painful this must have been, but she actually had a light in her studio. In fact, she was on, uh, when we were reading chapter two, Victoria Finch, and this huge light fell on her head and left a big egg on her head. And she suffered a concussion from that and was real foggy brained and um, was obviously had headaches. She had the local pain, but she also had the, the headache from that big light hitting her head. I guided her through a process and we did a neural health reset for her and immediately her headache and her brain fog were lifted by the time we were done with the neuro reset, which only takes just about three minutes. So this heart coherence and brain coherence, it works if you work it. And you don't have to be doing this for others. Just the fact that you do it for yourself will help heal others. But if you want to take it a step further, like I have, and you want to be able to to do this so that other people can get relief, then by all means, you know, there's plenty of us who are following, this is part of our calling, this is part of our path. So the key to the process of coherence is getting beyond, this is the key, pay attention. The key to the process of coherence is getting beyond the analytical mind, the thinking critical mind. We know this because we've measured it enough times in brain scans of our students. Their participation has also demonstrated that with enough practice, coherence can be achieved in a relatively short period of time. When the thinking brain is quieted, it moves into alpha or theta brainwave states. And this opens a doorway between the conscious and the subconscious mind. The autonomic nervous system then becomes more receptive to information. By raising our energy through the feelings of elevated emotions, we become less matter, less matter and more energy. So we're back to the energy waves. Energy waves we can mold. So we like the energy waves because then we can mold them and then they turn to particles. They start to coalesce. More and more of them start to build together. More and more and more particles, the more focus and attention we get to it. So we become less matter and more energy, less particle and more wave. The bigger the field we can create with these energies as energy, awareness, and consciousness, the more we can influence others in a non-local way. So this, one of the things that I have learned, and I just came to learn this aspect of it, which I didn't realize for a long time, was, wow, so the more we do these meditations, the more we really embrace this heart and brain coherence, we are less matter and more energy and that's how we are able to create create our own reality so our personality is no longer creating our reality like dr joe says but our our um we are able to create our reality by managing our personality and because we are in a heart and brain coherent state we are no longer all matter we're no longer all density we're not all stuck in the first three energy centers now we are energy we are potential energy waves which is why our body isn't as dense we are energy waves which is what allows the flexibility so that now as we put our focused attention on what it is that we want whatever whoever it is that we want to heal whatever it is that you're trying to create you're able to do it you're able to manifest faster because you're not all matter you're not a dense body where your electromagnetic field is collapsed no you have fanned out your electromagnetic wave you have a certain number of particles that you've been creating and then you have your energy waves and so you're you're able to mold the clay because you are a lighter lighter weight wise lighter in terms of the photons are all lit they're all light not darkness because they're full of light they are non-local because they are non-local and they are in that 5d realm now you can create and mold that with your focused attention. You decide 
this is what I want and you focus on the end result, what, it, what the outcome is that you want and what you would feel like. And then you add that elevated emotion of love and joy and gratitude and appreciation, which is the ultimate state of receivership because your brain now thinks, oh, she's appreciative, she's thankful because she already has it. So now you're magnetizing yourself with your electromagnetic field where your electromagnetic field from a scientific perspective and from a measurable perspective scientifically, they can measure the strength of your electromagnetivity. <laughs> you are a highly charged magnet that is even stronger, which is why you create faster because things are more magnetized. They come faster to you and you are putting out a signal from your heart and your brain out into the universe. So things start to come towards you. That's how it works. So now that you understand how it works here, now you have to do the work of getting this in place, which for a lot of us is the hardest thing to do because a lot of us have been hurt during with past relationships and so forth with different life circumstances, different people who have betrayed us. But you know what? Get over it. Take 17 seconds. It doesn't even take 17 seconds. Although Abraham says that it takes 17 seconds. You hold a focused thought with a high intention for 17 seconds. It starts to come into being. But a decision just takes a split second. And I'm gonna tell you, I had a vision back in 2013, which was uncanny. I've been very, um, always been kind of um, highly clairvoyant and clear cognizant and all those kind of funny things. And um, I was think I was making, I had made some pretty big life choices. And one of the, one of the visions that had come to me was that when you make a decision, make no mistakes, the moment that you make a decision, the universe, the energy all around you comes like a laser beam and it's almost like it cuts like with lightning bolt of fire. It cuts a line where it divides who you were before and now who you are in this present moment because anything that's behind that line is now in the past because of that decision. You have in essence created a new timeline new possibilities, you have started a new dimension of reality because of that decision. When that burst of energy that comes in the form of, a, of lightning and light and fire, it releases a tremendous surge of power to uplift you in that decision. If you look at what the word decision, the root word decision, there's day, which is of, Sidre, which is the Latin, C-I-D-R-E. Sidre means to cut. So of cutting. So when you decide to cut, you are you're making a decision. It's almost like an incision, but it's called a decision. You are cutting in your timeline of existence what was, and now you are making a choice that is changing the future and how it's going to go. Otherwise, you